Welcome everybody to this session. Um, I'm Karen Marie Eust. I am going to be lightly facilitating this session, but I'm also one of the speakers. Um, I'm at Union Presbyterian Seminary with the Children's Spirituality Research and Innovation Hub. And my colleague, Aaron Reibel, uh, who's the Associate Director at the Hub, is also here. Uh, we'll be presenting a one paper. But before we talk about uh, our work, Russ Dalton, who's at Bright Divinity School at Texas Christian University, is going to be sharing the other half of the sort of content that will uh, make up fodder for our conversation. Um, and what we've agreed to do together is Russ will kick us off and he'll talk for about 10 minutes or so. He tends to get enthusiastic, so I'm betting a little longer than that. But we said we try for 10 minutes. Um, and then Aaron will talk about our project for 10 minutes or so. And then I'm going to uh, speak to some points of intersection that the three of us have identified between the papers and then throw out some questions to get us started and what I hope will be a robust conversation for the majority of our time. So with no further ado, I'm gonna let Russ kick it off. Thank you, Karen Marie. And uh, yes, I get enthusiastic and I'm uh, ordained American Baptist. So us Baptist preachers tend to sometimes go a bit over time. Um, I'm going to try to speed along though. And uh, let me just double check. Everyone's seeing my uh, PowerPoint here on screen, okay? So thank you for the nods. Okay, uh, this will be just a very brief overview, sort of reminder uh, in hopes that you've read our papers uh, where we see some exciting uh, uh, connections uh, that'll hopefully, as Karen Marie said, be good fodder for conversation uh, with you all. Um, so again, the title, uh, Engaging Childish Biblical Interpretation to Enhance Children's Bible Lessons. This is an image from the uh, Childism Institute uh, website. I encourage you to check it out, childism.org. A lot of excellent international conferences on a wide variety of, of subjects. I won't read all of this from their brochure, Childism and Introduction. You can can see that. Uh, but uh, childism, it, it's an international movement of scholars and practitioners, which advocates for the recognition of children's full humanity, granting them inclusion and equity, and granting them agency, protecting their agency. Um, and they combat adultism. You'll hear me say that phrase uh, a number of times. It's this, this idea that we look at things, and I, I, I must say in religious education, historically, uh, educators have often looked at our religious traditions from an adult point of view, even when we've been working with children. Um, this finds application in, in, in many ways in, uh, in theology, uh, in practical theology. Uh, my focus today is on uh, religious education and Bible study in particular. And we've seen this in uh, applying some of the thoughts that childism brings out in some religious education texts that we're familiar with uh, on uh, religious education in general and uh, Bible lessons with children in particular where the idea is that we allow children to engage themes and interpret the Bible as children, not insist that they arrive at the adult interpretation. Uh, I must say years ago as a seminary student, revelatory for me, Roger and Gertrude Goebbels, uh, the Bible, a child's playground, right, in, in this point. Uh, but we have these other texts uh, that talk about uh, allowing children their agency. And I think one thing that we could do better at is often allowing them to choose what to learn, to listen to them, maybe before the, the Sunday school year starts or whatever. What, uh, what are you interested in learning? And allow them agency in how they explore a Bible passage or theme, you know, and I think we've done this quite well, uh, some of uh, our scholars, uh, uh, giving them uh, options and agency. Allow children to bring their own experience, their own context into the interpretation and application process. To create space to listen to children. Uh, and, and many of us talk about uh, 
how to wonder with children, right? I wonder, uh, and, and with godly play and, and so much more. What I would like us to connect to is how might we even enhance and go another step by looking at this growing movement of childish interpretation of the Bible. 15 years ago, you would only find a handful of uh, scholarly books on the child in the Bible or children's perspective on the Bible. Today, there are dozens of books by Bible scholars focused on children in the biblical world. And it started especially, how do we understand children in the biblical world? Now, uh, uh, the children in the biblical world section of the Society of Biblical Literature, uh, just as many of the papers seem to be focused on this hermeneutical approach of childist interpretation, sometimes called child-oriented criticism of the Bible. And what are we talking about here? I talk about it in my paper. But uh, really, it's these scholars drawing upon feminist and womanist interpretation, you know, but by focusing on a marginalized group, uh, childist interpretation lends another contextual liberative lens to biblical scholarship. Uh, they engage in research on the role and state of children in the ancient world. And similar to feminist and womanist scholars, right, they, they expose what's often invisible, just saying, yes. Children, they are present. They are active. Uh, in New Testament studies now, childish scholars, they are disciples. They're not just metaphors for discipleship. It's, it's clear they're talking in it, this radical movement, right, of inclusion um, uh, in, in this realm of God movement included children. Um, they are valuable in the ancient world. Uh, not disposable, they're valuable, but they are vulnerable. Childish scholars think through the story from a child or children's point of view. They resist that adultist interpretation. And childish scholars read in ways that reflect on the agency and place of children in the biblical world and today's world. So just like many contextual readings, and, and again, the sort of the, the, the history from womanist and feminist scholars, uh, these scholars often, many of them, don't stay with uh, you know, this objective view of uh, the ancient world, but it leads them to talk about children and advocating for children in today's world in their, their writing. As uh, Dana Nolan Fuel wrote in The Children of Israel, what would it mean to read the Bible for the sake of children? So I, I look at three in the paper. Uh, Three stories, uh, and uh, first look at uh, what historically in children's Bibles, uh, children's Bible lessons, how they've used these stories. These three stories happen to be of children, but childish scholars don't just look at stories that are explicitly about children, because children are everywhere. They're in the crowds, etc. But uh, one I looked at was Isaac. And the, this is an adultist perspective, right? Is uh, They retell the story of Isaac as someone who's submissive, obedient unto death. Uh, they often retell the story to say that, well, Isaac was a willing sacrifice. I is for Isaac, whom meekly you see submitting to Abraham's faith and decree. Uh, Isaac, the boy who obeyed this whole book. That's a chilling title. Um, and they make the argument that Isaac could have escaped but he knew that you should obey your parents no matter what, obeying those in authority. The lesson to get out of it is be meek, submissive, obey those in authority. Uh, childish scholars on the binding of Isaac make the point that the text doesn't tell us anything about Isaac's thoughts or point of view. The, the text, Genesis grants no agency to Isaac. As a matter of fact, this word binding is kind of an aggressive word. Uh, it, it suggests he was, he was strapped down, even though some of the other versions have uh, Isaac just laying down uh, meekly on the altar. And, and they point out this would be a very traumatic experience. Uh, child scholars point out that there uh, is no, nothing in the Bible that tells of Isaac and Abraham together after this point. 
speculation. Did Isaac even go home with Abraham after this event? But a very traumatic experience. Uh, should we use this with children? Uh, when we use it as obey your parents, no matter what, is that a grooming lesson? Are we grooming children that, hey, if you're being abused, you should obey your parents or the adults in your in your life, no matter what? Um, raises a lot of concerns. For the sake of time, uh, I'm going to skip over this. I encourage this. It was fascinating for me, work that's been done on so-called Naaman's Little Maid, uh, who was ripped from her home, uh, made to be a, sl uh, a slave, but in a lot of Bible lessons, children's Bibles, oh, she was selfless. She served her master, not herself. Uh, in other words, she helps those in power preserve the status quo. I want to point out this uh, upper left corner uh, illustration here is uh, from the mid 1800s uh, children's Bible. And you'll notice Naaman's little maid is uh, depicted as a person of color. Interesting that she is the only Israelite in that whole children's Bible who's depicted as a person of color, presumably because she was a slave. Uh, you know, some troubling, but she's presented as this nice member of the family. Uh, and childless scholars would say, no, she was a slave. Uh, it's trivializing to call her a maid. Uh, she's strategic and strategic and savvy in the way that she frames her wishes. She uses her limited agency to improve her life. And the, the story as a whole, I don't have time to go into it, but serves to mock those in power, question the status quo very different than how it's often used in religious education. The focus I want Okay, are you seeing me now? Yes, now Good. it's back. Okay. So, uh yeah, uh Bible scholars would uh, uh childless scholars would point out this boy, he's not given a name, uh but wherever the gospel is told, it is told in what he's done in memory of him. Uh, we're never told the boy volunteers to give away his, his food. Andrew just said, here's a boy. Probably this boy had very limited agency. Sharon Betsworth would make this point. Uh, he was poor. Uh, poor people made their loaves with barley, not with uh, wheat. Uh, perhaps very limited agency. Then again, uh, Amy Linda Benalen, uh has this book coming out next month, The Gifts They Bring. I was fortunate enough to get a, a pre-publication copy. I'm writing a blurb for the back, uh, an endorsement for the back cover. Uh, but uh, she makes the point, as she has in an uh, earlier book, that children were disciples. Maybe this boy was one of the disciples. And so would have been a part of the, uh, part of that inner circle. So children are not just metaphor for dis uh, adult discipleship in the gospels. They, they were disciples. And so what are the implications for religious education? Just to, to wind things up and say, is this a story about generosity? So looking at this childish scholarship, I always say, is not so that we lecture to the children about uh, what those scholars have said, but it gives us a mindset to say, ah, if I want to teach a lesson about generosity, a thematic lesson, is this necessarily the best? Uh, Bible passage to use. But if we are going to raise that point, maybe we allow the children to. We allow them to wonder about it. We can give the background here. We can, or maybe children might recall a time in their own lives when adults pressured them to share or give away something. And if a child says, I don't like whether they might have made him give away his meal, let's not shame them for thinking that way. Is it okay to advocate for yourself? Uh, but maybe the boy did. Maybe they decide the boy did graciously surrender What uh, his food. What might they glean from that? If the boy was counted amongst the disciples traveling with Jesus, what implications might children make from that for their lives? That they are full disciples? Of course, that has to be a lesson for the adults in our communities of faith as well. So I know that's a very quick overview and sorry for the, the, the technical problem there. Uh, but I think Karen Marie, I'll, I'll stop there and, and turn it back to you. Thanks Russ. 
Um, and I'm gonna, uh, I see that we um, uh, have a question in the chat. We'll come to that in a few minutes. I'm gonna have Erin share a little bit about the project she and I worked on, and then we'll open for conversation with everyone. Erin, I will share now. Great, thank you, Karen Marie. Um, so this is a really exciting innovation that was part of our Children's Research Spirituality and Innovation Hub projects. Um, we recruited 12 different um, church communities, um, largely, um, well, entirely, um, to participate. And this was an embodied prayer practice. So we put out um, the call for participation um, November, December, um, with the idea of starting this right around Lent, although not all of our um, participants um, sort of followed a Lenten schedule. Some of them did. Um, and we called it embodied prayer. It's really movement meditations um, and it's prayer with our bodies. Um, to develop these, these prayers, um, Karen Marie and I first came up with sort of overarching themes such as connection or empowerment. Um, and then we just sort of played with motions. Um, so, you know, largely this was Karen Marie and I in our offices um, doing, you know, different movements that sort of felt to us like they embodied um, those sort of themes. So the idea of connection, what movements made us feel um, or brought that sense of connection. Um, so once we came up with a series of movements, then we added words to them. So really at the root, this is um, a practice of, of movement um, and how these movements feel within the body. Um, and then we talked to all of um, our different participants that were interested in participating. Um, when I spoke with them, I met with most of them at least twice before they started the project, sometimes three times um, or more, um, and chatted with them a little bit about their background. Mostly these are, are progressive Protestant churches. Um, the individuals who led this um, had pretty robust prayer lives. So they were familiar with a variety of different prayer styles. So um, certainly traditional um, you know, corporate prayers, um, you know, silent prayers, you know, hands, hands and head folded and bowed, um, but also, you know, other types of fair, prayer, censoring prayer, um, labyrinths, um, walking prayer. Um, many of them had experiences with yoga, meditation, um, theater background where they sort of were used to that expressive type of movement. Um, so the, all that is say in their personal life, they had sort of um, this robust background of prayer. And I think that's important as we consider the implications of our research. Um, so they did these prayers for six weeks, um, and, you know, once a week, largely this took place uh, in a in a, their Sunday setting. So um, some of them were midweek, but the but the majority of them were in their Sunday setting in whatever capacity they were in their programming. Um, kids were roughly between the ages of three to 12. Um, and the prayers followed a, a particular framework. So you focused, um, you know, they were focused in four parts. So self, others, earth slash the world um, and the transcendental. Um, so you had sort of those four movements within the prayer practices. I um, mean, if you're interested in seeing examples of this, I know there's some in um, on our website, there's a couple and they've been included in the paper as well. So there's videos to accompany these in addition to scripts. Um, so what we found um, was really interesting. So the first is sort of assumptions about children, um, who they are, um, how they should behave, what children's prayer should be like. And when I think about this, I want to think about like what praying looks like for children um, and then what prayer is for children. And these were the assumptions that our leaders came to. So what praying looks like for children, um, the leaders um, anticipated or, or predicted um, or perceived, I guess, perceived is the word, that children were praying if they were calm, if they were quiet, if they um, looked um, serious and focused, um, even though within their own personal prayer life, they were comfortable with a much broader range of what prayer could look like. So if I spoke to them individually, they understood you dancing and joyful and happy, but within the context of children, they understood children's prayer to look like um, this sort of very traditional practice. Um, so that idea that they would be calm, um, that they would be showing, you know, quote unquote, good behavior, which is often um, is compliant behavior, um, you know, when we think about that. Um, and, and that that is, that's how the leader understood they were prayerful. So any of these other pieces, sort of like them behaving silly um, or, um, you know, doing things that weren't within sort of what they deemed calm um, or good behavior was then deemed as not prayerful. Um, and so it was interesting to see this, um, 
you know, this sort of play out with the leaders. Um, in addition, there's this idea of what children is, what prayer is for children. Um, and, you know, we have it on the slide here that dear God and amen, our prayers did not begin with dear God and they did not end with amen. We started with sort of a breathing exercise to center. Um, and this was really difficult for some of our leaders. They expected there to be sort of these traditional markers of what prayer was. It should start with God, or at the very least, it should reference God. We had leaders who would say God, and then they would go into the rest of what the prayer is, because that is sort of this marker of what prayer means. Um, there, there, it needed an ending. Um, and so some of them would put amen at the end. Some of them would go back to the breathing exercise because they thought that that, um, was, you know, that, that conveyed the ending. Um, and so they had these ideas of, of what a prayer should be like for children. And we're going to get into some of this as well, um, in one of our other pieces, but the idea that they are supposed to learn something about it and that the words should match the movements and that, um, you know, it's supposed to convey sort of this very traditional sense of what prayer is, um, that was not reflective in our leader's own personal prayer life. So there's this um, sort of backtracking to a traditional prayer format for children that was not true of the individual's own prayer practice. So, so these sort of unconscious um, assumptions really affected how our leaders perceived um, this prayer practice with the children. Um, the next piece is this disconnect between adult expectations and children's responses. Um, and we've added here this punching and big emotion. So one of our prayers included the idea of feeling angry and it had a punching movement to it. And you punch into the into air. Um, yeah, this is drawing from many movements of other places, whether it's um, perhaps the martial arts, um, using a punching bag, you know, that, that this is a way that we deal with big emotions. Um, almost everyone had um, difficulties with this particular practice. Um, we had people who decided to, to write it out of the prayer. They wouldn't do this with the children because they felt that it was inappropriate. Um, almost everyone mentioned it um, in our sessions together that this felt very uncomfortable to be punching in a prayer. Um, and this is besides separate conversations that prayer is a place where we deal with big emotions, where we deal with anger and frustration. And the idea that you could be yelling at God um, and angry with God in a prayer, all of those were things that our leaders deemed acceptable. But when it came time to sort of embodying that with the kids, um, they really had a lot of um, reservations about that. In addition, there are a lot of concerns about how kids would behave. Like, can we let them do this punching motion in our session, or is it going to get to be problematic? Are they going to punch each other? Um, or is it going to be rambunctious and we will lose control, um, stop the prayer? You know, all of these sort of other pieces that were in their mind. Um, the ones who did it, we had one who chose not to do it, um, but the ones who did the punching, none of that came to be true. So there were lots of concerns and there continued to be concerns even after the practice, but it wasn't true. The kids didn't punch each other. They didn't, um, it didn't make them more aggressive during the rest of their session. Um, it was just the teacher's own sort of perceptions of how, of what was or was not appropriate for children to express during a prayer. Um, and again, in spite of the fact that, that things like punching mo movements um, are other places in children's lives and are other practices um, that they would engage in in other, in other locations. Um, in addition, that idea of silly versus calm. So um, there are a couple of uh, conversations around the, the fact that the kids were silly during these prayers, and that was perceived then to be not prayerful. Um, but all of the kids, you know, in the in the responses that we were getting, um, the kids were largely engaged with the prayer. Um, so this idea that silliness is therefore not, um, you know, the adults perceive that silliness is not a prayerful response, um, as opposed to, you know, in, in calm, being calm or focused or um, behaving appropriately, however that um, is defined for the leader, is an appropriate response. So silly, therefore, is not being prayerful was sort of a piece that our leaders came to um, with this as well. Well, um, in addition, or lastly, this emphasis on the didactic teaching and cognitive understanding. So when it got to the prayer practice, there still was this underlining piece that 
they were teaching prayer. Um, and this practice was designed to be an experience of prayer, but our leaders really wanted the kids to learn how to pray. Pray. So there was a lot of ideas of, can they repeat the prayer? Can they repeat the movements? Um, can they teach the movements to other? Do they understand? Do they get it that this is prayer? Um, and those were all um, huge or big concerns for our leaders. Um, you know, focusing sort of on this didactic piece of prayer, as opposed to just praying, um, experiencing prayer with the children and letting the kids response be their prayerful response um, in this prayer. So, so just, you know, not being able to disconnect that um, desire to have them learn the prayer um, was a real challenge for many of our leaders. Kira Marie, would you add anything else? No, I think you've covered it. I'll move us to the intersections between the papers that the three of us noticed in a, conver a previous Zoom conversation we had as we worked on the session. Um, one of the things that we are very aware of is that both of these projects begin with a deep appreciation for children's agency and children's capabilities as theological reflectors. Um, and that that's uh, and that that is something that is not sort of commonplace in the materials or the practices used with children in a lot of uh, conventional Sunday school or uh, weekday programs or even um, Christian church-based preschools, et cetera, that we saw. But uh, there's really a sense that children um, need to be told how to do it and what to think and, and that behavior modification or, or appropriate behavior is often the goal and not um, making space for children's um, agency and uh, children's own um, interpretive reflection there. Um, we also noticed that we uh, both projects are using a kind of interdisciplinary approach. Uh, we're not just working from an educational uh, standpoint, uh, but we're also looking in uh, Russ's case at childism and biblical criticism and how various frameworks for that could all inform religious education. And in Aaron's in my case, we're particularly looking to the social sciences and uh, what we're learning about child development that is superseding the old stage theories uh, about what's appropriate or not appropriate and what children are able to do or not able to do. And, um, and especially in Aaron's in my case, looking at um, new findings around moral development that suggest that children engage in naive uh, moral reasoning as infants and simply grow in that space, which I think also underscores some of what Russ is saying. Thirdly, um, we all uh, see and um, talk about learning as exploratory or uh, non-directive rather than guiding children towards a preconceived conclusion. Um, and that that's ve a very difficult thing to translate into practice with volunteer teachers. Um, and it's not usually something that we see in children's curriculum where a main point has been um, settled upon uh, as the point of the lesson and then everything's designed to reinforce that point. Um, we also, and I, uh, this was Russ's wonderful language, that there's a prevailing assumption that the role of Bible stories and Aaron and I added and prayers is to raise up and valorize status quo virtues. That it's to reinforce how we want children to behave and what we think is good uh, forms of behavior um, and good ways of, of perceiving their role in the world. Um, so that valorizing status quo virtues. Thank you, Russ, for that statement. I'm going to use it many, many times. Um, and then the importance of engaging difficult issues and emotions with children. Uh, many of these Bible stories that Russ points to are complicated, um, and they point to the complexity of children's lives that we're not always comfortable with, and, and that uh, those who work with children in ministry are not comfortable with. But if the global pandemic taught us anything, it's that trauma can cross all different kinds of contexts and settings. Um, and the assumption that children are innocent and removed from the troubles of the world is a very... Um, elite and privileged position to take, um, and likely not even true of children who might fall into those categories. Um, and finally, both of us are really talking about redefining the role of adults in children's religious education, um, moving away from this sort of um, 
guides who point to a particular conclusion and instead to persons who create a space where children's reflection um, can be the primary um, movement forward where exploration is the goal and not a conclusion. So as we move into conversation for the last half hour of our time, um, we have some questions to put forward for discussion, and I'll drop these in the chat when I stop sharing as well. And we also welcome the questions that you would bring. Um, so one of our questions is, you know, what are your thoughts on these points of intersection and other points of intersection that you may have seen when you read these two papers side by side? Um, in what ways do these papers challenge your assumptions about children's religious educations? Uh, in what ways do they prompt you to reframe your understanding and approach to children's spiritual and or religious nurture? And how might religious educators redefine age appropriate topics and practices to better reflect the real lives of children? Um, I'm gonna stop sharing and those are not in any particular order that we need to go. Um, but as I said, I'll drop them in and I welcome those who might want to jump in at this point. Nice, and, and maybe I'll start, Karen Marie, just by responding to Emily's uh, excellent question uh, in the chat uh, that, uh, that she offered, uh, because uh, it's an important issue to me. I, I just, uh, this uh, idea, uh, and, and maybe I should read the chat and if people haven't, uh, that, uh, oh, it's a question about adultism, childism. Uh, as a white woman, I would never, say I could write a womanist perspective, how can an adult write a child perspective ethically and truthfully? Uh, and an, an excellent question that I've struggled with and I've actually raised with that SBL uh, uh, session that, that does the childist interpretation and in some of the things that I've written uh, on, on the issue. Um, as I say, for religious educators, uh, the idea is not necessarily for me to write a childist interpretation uh, or a childist curriculum based on childist uh, writers, but it, it might seem a deep dive to do all of this research just to play some offense and defense. The offense, I guess, would be to be open to children's ideas, to understand where they might be coming from, maybe to introduce them to aspects of the text, at least in background, that might be of interest to them uh, and relate to children. And then uh, also to resist adultism ourselves, the, the, the knee jerk, the way we were taught many Bible passages, that uh, adultist perspective. Um, some of you might recall an article I wrote years ago about the child Jesus, meek and mild. You know, again, we want to uh, raise up the status quo. Um, now, there is sort of an analogy. For example, I read biblical interpretation and different thoughts uh, from my colleague, Will Gaffney, who's a, a womanist uh, Bible scholar. Uh, I would never uh, say that I could teach that perspective and offer that perspective, but I better be aware of it, right? Uh, especially as a cisgender, straight, white male, uh, neurotypical, I, I should be aware of all of these different perspectives uh, and be able to hear my students when they raise those issues. And perhaps uh, if there's a voice not in the room uh, to be able to lift that uh, up. Uh, now, how do we hear children's voices? Some of that is the way, as Karen Marie was talking about, that, that we frame our lessons or our times of prayer. Um, one of the things that I've raised in the that uh, SBL uh, Children in the Biblical World section is that our research, especially from childless interpretation, should include interpretations by children. And there's been a few publications that have done this, but we could do more. There's resistance, you know, with the IRB and how much do we publish what children say. Uh, but I think that's an important way of hearing those children's voices, even in the literature. Uh, but but mainly, uh, Emily, my thought was 
not that we teach and are the authority on children's voices, but it helps us to hear and it encourages and challenges us to facilitate children sharing their perspectives on these Bible passages. I, I hope that helps. I see a comment from Jocelyn Whitler in the uh, chat uh, talking about the virtues being about compliance and wondering if we could teach good trouble, to quote John Lewis, and distinguish it from other kinds of trouble with kids, um, or are we able to do that? Um, Josh, you're welcome to say more to that if you'd like, or if somebody else wants to comment and respond on what Josh has said. I think what Josh, um, I, I don't want to speak to what Josh um, or try to allude to what they're saying, um, but I believe that it's very important for us to teach our young people how to be uh, 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 active social agents, uh, social change agents. Um, and how can you uh, teach, uh, not even teach, but facilitate the rebellion that is um, present within children, right? Um, how you teach them to facilitate lean into um, the different ways and non-normative ways that they are seeing the world. Um, that is very important. I believe that um, as religious educators, we have uh, particularly with religious educators who, uh, who are followers of Jesus have a template in Jesus um, and how we could show them how to be um, good troublemakers um, toward a particular end. Um, so that's often the challenge is in our institutions, within church institutions, there's oftentimes a um, uh, antagonism to that kind of positionality um, where children are, are, are to be meek uh, or to be, uh, to follow orders and follow protocol and so forth. Um, but what does that look like for us to be um, more facilitators um, of that kind of rebellious um, spirit that is present within children? Thank you, Andre. Thank you, Thank you for that. Yeah, I've, I've written and uh, I, I teach this, uh, you know, regularly and talking about it, that one of the things, the success of the Freedom Riders and, and the Nashville Riders, as James Lawson talked about this, that they grew up from childhood, the, the people he, he talked to, uh, learning about justice as a part of the biblical text, as a part of their faith. But it's the null curriculum so much for children today, even in passages that seem to talk about speaking truth to power, to standing up against oppression, uh, to, uh, to resisting authorities. Uh, they're made into these, uh, you know, they're, they're twisted until they're taught uh, to affirm these status quo affirming virtues. And people say, well, children, they're too young to understand all of this or to, to be, have righteous anger or to understand the complexities of the social uh, issues. Uh, boy, we teach children about prayer, right? <laughs> uh, if you can explain to me about the complexities of prayer <laughs> uh, as an adult, uh, you know, let me know. But it's it's a part that becomes the null curriculum. So it's not surprising that even in our mainline denominations, so many adults, if if we start preaching about social justice, they kind of nod and say, "Okay, preacher, but I know, I know what my faith is about. It's about not making waves. It's about being nice and compliant." And so I, I think you're both raising such an important points uh, uh, about how we need to teach this to our children. And I'm going to invite Erin to come in and say some more about that, because Gregory had asked, what are examples of status quo virtues? And Russ, I think you mentioned you know, compliance being one. But Erin, I know this is a passion for you right now. Why don't you say some more about that? Yeah, I mean, I, I I would go, you know, again on that idea of compliance, that idea that children should be quiet and calm and serious, um, especially as we think about the project that we did focused on prayer. Um, and and that that is, you know, um that they are behaving appropriately according to what are the norms of that congregation or that group, which again is 
largely quiet, um, you know, sitting and not making noise, um, be, you know, responding in ways that um, are very, you know, traditional, you know, that we would, you know, in prayer, especially, right, we would close our eyes, bow our heads, um, and that that, um, that that would be um, sort of those, those virtues that are being lifted up, um, you know, and I think, as we've mentioned, it's sort of a behavioral piece, it's a behavioral idea of how shit kids should behave. Um, and to address some of the discussion that's been going on, one of the things that we talked about with our leaders was the kids response is their response, right? Like, instead of making us assumptions about what it should look like or not look like. And, you know, all of these preconceived ideas of what you want the kids to do, their response is their response. So if their response is silly or laughing or um, stretching or not even following the movements that the teachers are doing, that is their response. And that is valid. Um, and that is a, a worthwhile response. And that is an okay response. And that is, that is their, um, their way of praying. And it's, it's just as valid as all of these other ways that the teachers want it to, to show forth. And um, so when I think about sort of those first steps towards, you know, how do we act in the world and how do we become people um, that um, don't just go with the status quo and don't just have a faith that teaches them to behave good or compliant, um, you know, that it starts with sort of validating their own individual response um, to these to these pieces as they are as they come up. I see a question in the chat too about the place of structure in childish religious education. Uh, it says the commandments propose structured behavior. Can these be taught to children uh, with insisting on boundaries? Um, and I think there's um, part of what we're trying to point to is different kinds of structures. Um, and I suspect Russ will want to say something to this as well. But we're we're suggesting that it it is possible to um, have a theme and explore that theme and suggest to children that they try different paths as they explore that theme and to listen to what they have to say um, and to ask questions, um, including questions that might challenge some of what they're asking without, again, insisting on a particular outcome. Um, I had noted that, you know, sometimes we confuse politeness with virtue. Um, and we expect children to behave in ways that show kind of their um, subservience to adults by doing whatever the adult asks of them in the way the adult asks at the time the adult asks. And that that's uh, that this sort of politeness or uh, certain normative behaviors that um, that corral them to make them fit into an adultist world. Um, and congregational worship is an excellent example of how the, how we often have even created a secondary um, setting for children in the name of making it more age appropriate and comfortable for them. But in reality, primarily the discussion of moving children out of worship has been about adults not wanting to have to deal with children's normal behaviors in that space. Um, so I think it's about what kinds of structures are we creating and who benefits from those structures? Um, is it keeping Sunday school um, under wraps and quiet so it doesn't disturb or is it encouraging children, uh, children's curiosity and exploration so that they come to wrestle with the existential questions that are a part of faith? Um, and like I said, Russ, I know you're going to have something to say on that too. So I'll, I'll see the floor to you now. I'll, I'll just be brief. Thanks, uh, Karen Marie, and thanks for the, the question. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, just like with a, adult uh, religious education lessons, where the, uh, you know, the religious educator can function as a facilitator, as a guide, maybe at times as the expert reader in the room, the one that's prepared more uh, to be able to chime in, but not the one uh, necessarily uh, directing uh, each facet, but uh, I, I think you said a lot what I was going to say, Karen Marie, that often we structure religious education. I, my goodness, we uh, structure public schooling in uh, adultist ways, right? These are not the way that uh, understanding children that we would best facilitate their education, their learning, their exploration, especially, uh, but that structure does keep them in line and, and, and we can point to something if there's certain guidelines 
uh, here in Texas, you know, it's very big uh, teaching to the high state tests and proving that uh, people have learned certain things by having a very structured lesson. And uh, yeah, a lot of childist uh, scholars and, uh, you know, people looking at this, it, it is sort of challenging. It, it, it's uh, pushing back against some of those uh, traditional structures. I think what we found as well is that we're holding children to a different standard than we're even holding adults to. Um, so for example, in our prayer practice, you know, the adults that were leading this were had a much um, broader language for prayer than what they were allowing for children, right? They were saying that even, even for kids, the prayer had to be so much more narrow than even what they, they had in their own practice. Um, and so I think that's really um Interesting as well that, that we can't even let children be um, as free to express themselves as adults are. Natasha, I see that you're unmuted. Did you want to uh, make a comment or ask a question? Anyone else? Well, let me go back to um, the, some of the questions that we uh, posed to you all and see if anybody's got some comments around that. Um, uh, in what ways do you see this? I'll sort of com combine a couple. In what ways does, do, does what we're talking about suggest a need for or a reframing of children's religious education as you know it? You know, what would have to give in our settings? What would have to change in uh, children's ministry settings in light of the kinds of things that we have talked about today? Anybody have a comment? Uh, yes, I have a comment. Uh, if if I may, I think a whole lot needs to give. Uh, um, uh, going by the the research uh, some of you have done um, in 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 our adult education in the Bible, we read about uh, we are created in God's image and likeness, and I'm afraid sometimes we want to create the the children into uh, our own images our particular teachers or facilitators image and likeness so uh, having said that a lot needs to change uh, about that in in allowing um, religious education like the word uh, to achieve its effect even in children um, so to to that extent I would say what, what needs to give is this uh, anxiety that um, uh, if, if the children are not caged into a particular mode, uh, then they are gonna spoil something. They're gonna spoil this, uh, they're, they're gonna spoil tradition. They're, they're gonna uh, spoil uh, our uh, religious practices as we, as we now know them to be so so i i guess uh, there is some a bit of uh something could give when i ask myself what am i nervous about if i ask that question then i am um, i give myself permission to experience um, uh, some difference but i worry of course because children um you, 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 this your research doesn't think uh, children are tabula rasa. It seems to suggest that children come with uh, a whole lot. Could you could you say something about that? Because uh, um, uh, uh, learning as information or socialization as learning from the deposit from from the. Um, a repository of the community seem to be lost in in this research when children are when when religious education is just about children exploring could you could you say more could you say something about that any of you could contribute thank you so i'll say something about that and then russ i know that um dr moon has a question he wants to ask you so we'll wrap that way um, um Dr. Um, Paul Bloom at the Yale uh, Center for um, Studies of Children and Paul Harris at Harvard's uh, uh, Harvard Educational Psychologist who works with a um, research center there have both done extensive 
research on children's moral development that really um, challenges this idea of children as a blank slate um, that we then write on, that demonstrates that, uh, for instance, Paul Bloom's work shows that infants come with a strong bias towards helpers and a, uh, and a sort of anti-bias towards hinderers. Um, and he's done research with children as young as four to six months that demonstrates that uh, they are prefer uh, puppets who help push a ball up a um, incline over puppets who try to keep another puppet from pushing the ball up the incline, which serves a sort of moral um, compass in terms of human survival, but also in terms of social interaction that's embedded in very young ages. Um, and Paul Harris's work in particular, the part I like to especially pay attention to in his work is the function that questioning plays and the back and forth of questioning in children's moral development, which again, as any parent knows, starts very, very early, even before language uh, in words, there's the language of actions that suggest this kind of give and take, social give and take. So, um, so our earlier thinking of young children as um, essentially um, in need of filling up or pouring into uh, is being challenged by this new kind of research that we really weren't able to do a couple of decades ago because we didn't have gaze monitors on computers that could tell us more about what was going on in a very young child's mind that they can use in research now. Um, and with that, because we're getting close to time, I'm going to um, invite uh, Dr. Moon Sun um, to ask his question of Russ. Well, thank you so much. I'm very uh, interested in uh, so and uh, Dr. R uh, Russell Dalton's. Uh, he said uh, uh, about the concept or well, the children is one of as a child is one of the disciples. Uh, that uh, was the meaning. So children's leadership. Uh, share with uh, other TED caters. So in Korean context after COVID-19, so many uh, churches, uh, Sunday school, the shrink is a very serious problem. Mm -hmm. So in this uh, Korean context, if we adopt such a leadership model uh, that is uh, sharing with uh, children, uh, share with uh, some readership, with uh, Facebook community, how they think about some transformation. So uh, show with uh, children in the aspect of the community readership. Uh, yes, uh, so in the Korean context uh, in community uh, show with uh, the recognize uh, children's engagement but uh, this engagement is a uh, marginal area, uh, such as uh, reading the Bible in the worship time and some dancing uh, participation. Uh, however, the, uh, so in this uh, structure uh, consistency, uh, did not recognize uh, and children's readership uh, about uh, this is a making areas. How do you think about that? I, I have very, uh, concern about uh, some show with children in the aspect of the readership of our community. Thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, first of all, I should say that in, in, in knowing you and your work, I would say that you probably have a better view of, of how that uh, works with uh, in your context uh, with children. And, and I'm interested in hearing some of those uh, views that you have, but I think I think you're right in in a number of contexts. And this uh, was born now in that uh, book I showed on screen just very briefly. Child theology, global perspectives. Marsha Bungie uh, did that. That that all over uh, uh, the world. There's this perspective that oh, we might have children do you know a reading or dancing but not respecting them as people who can theologize themselves or people who have agency for leadership in their context. And I wonder if one of the, the clues is, uh, you know, I, I, I spoke about this uh, author, uh, uh, Amy um, uh, Lindemann Allen, and her earlier uh, bi uh, 
biblical scholarship text is uh, about, uh, what is it called? Uh, for the king, the kingdom is theirs. And, uh, you know, helping the leadership uh, recognize that this is part of the biblical tradition is having children in leadership and recognizing them as full participants uh, in communities of faith, in the realm of God, uh, for, from the Christian tradition, from the very beginning. But we see this in Jewish education as well, right? The Passover meal, uh, many of us are aware of, you know, the children are participating, they're giving uh, their thoughts. Uh, but, and I don't know if we have time, Karen Marie, but uh, I'm interested in hearing your thoughts, uh, Moonsan. That was intriguing that you, you have some thoughts uh, in your context. We could hear one minute from uh, Moon Sun, and then we will, I think Mary will need to close us out, but uh, happy to have him uh, share it for 60 seconds if he could. You have thoughts, Moon Sun, on, uh, in your context, you were talking about you have some ideas about including children in in leadership uh, in Korea. We'd be interested so, in hearing. Yeah. yeah, I'm very, uh, this is the very important impetus to changing the community's uh, structures. So, uh, so my church, my local church is very small size church. Uh, so we, we do not have Sunday school. Uh, since the, the my local church is very small size. However, recently I have met a one children is elementary school student. He have interest in the Bible, even though he is not a Christian people and Christian family. I'm talking about with him. So, the, so I, I, I talked with him. And so and adult uh, children, so very same, uh, so same level. And so I have learned a lot of insight from him. So in faith, Christian faith, and some other areas of our, our everyday life. In the point, I think, sharing uh, mother with children uh, in the aspect of leadership is the very imp important point uh, to changing our Communities, climate, and uh, some environment. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'm very. I'm going to jump in quickly and note that I've put in the chat the um, feedback form. And I also want to urge all of you, starting right now, actually, um, you'll have to go back to the schedule, get to the link because it's in a different room, is the advisory council meeting. And you're all thoroughly welcome to participate in that um, at REA. Karen Marie, any last thoughts? Just thank you all. Um, and if you want to continue the conversation, um, our email addresses are on our papers. So please uh, be in touch with any of us. We'd love to chat more about this. Take care. See you in other sessions.